Good morning. <laughs> we get to be in God's Word together, which I'm very excited about. We are continuing this passage in John chapter 12, and we talked about this a little bit last week, but I want to emphasize this even more. The very first 11 chapters of John really had to do with Jesus uh, coming to earth uh, and his earthly ministry, and so we've got roughly a little more than three years in 11 chapters. But now that we're in John chapter 12, what we're going to experience is we're going to experience roughly 50 days as we study 11 chapters, 50 days of Jesus's life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And so there is something to be, there's something special about jumping into this the way that we're going to, because it's going to go a lot uh, slower. We're going to be able to dive deeper than we're used to. And what we're studying today actually is what begins in what many people know as the Passion Week. We're talking about Palm Sunday today, and yet we don't have palm branches. We're not doing all of those things. But this passage in particular, what's special about it is it's seen in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And often when you look at the four different Gospels, there's many things that are written by John that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't have. Most of the things Matthew, Mark, and Luke write they all write together because they're seen together. They're known as the synoptic gospels. So it's interesting that John also writes about what Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote. And so as we're going to study this today, my hope is that you would see the truth of the gospel, not just in this passage, but in all passages that we teach, because that really is why we exist. Our, to live and to have our being is in the fact that Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so we're jumping into this passage, but I want to take you to a scripture that we usually look at around Easter time. And it is known as the Pauline Gospel. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. But even though he's writing to the church in Corinth and it's chapter 15, this is the message that chronologically most people know as really the first thing in the New Testament. And so Paul writes this at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15. He says, brothers, let me remind you of the gospel that I preached to you. And then he goes in verse 3, he says, for what I received, Paul says, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, according to the Scriptures. Now, here's what's cool about this. Because this is considered chronologically one of the first things in the New Testament, it's very clear he's not talking about the New Testament. He says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, the Old Testament, that he was buried, verse 4. And then he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And so here's what we're going to see. We're going to see that Jesus is in the Old Testament. We're going to see that all of it points to something that is so important as God gives us the perspective to see who he is through his word. I start with that. I start with the Pauline gospel to remind us of Jesus's life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And this is the most important message one can hear, not just the facts, not just the overwhelming evidence that Jesus physically rose from the dead, but what it means that you and I can have a relationship with God because of what God, because of what God did. My hope is, and honestly, we talk a lot about this, that this would not harden your hearts. When we open the Word of God, when we start to read it, when we start to hear it, if we ignore it or disobey it, it actually, over time, hardens our heart to a point where we're stiff-arming God more and more. And so we have this gospel that I hope that it actually takes root in your hearts every week, every day as you live this life. This gospel, this invitation that sinners like us can be made righteous. We can have right standing before God, not because of anything we've done, but because of God's goodness expressed to us through the work and obedience of Jesus Christ. Listen, I've taught the Palm Sunday message a lot. In fact, I've taught it from Matthew, I've taught it from Mark, I've taught it from Luke. I've never taught it from John before. And I got to be really honest, I'm going to confess, when I first looked at this passage, I was like, oh, I don't really want to teach this because here's the thing, for most of my ministry up until just a few years ago, I was what was known as an assistant pastor. I was a number two. I was, I was an evangelism pastor, a teaching pastor. And so I would be given this passage because the lead guy always wants to teach Easter, right? And so I would be given this the, the Sunday before and when I would study this passage, it's good, but it's just pointing towards what's going to happen. And yet when I read in John, God showed me some things in this text and in the story that I had never seen before. So let's go. Verse 12. The next day, John writes, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 
The next day, Sunday, which is known as Palm Sunday to many of us, this was the day after Jesus was anointed with the perfume and Mary dried his feet with her hair. And what we studied last week, it continued this tension of the fact that Jesus had performed this miracle, he had raised Lazarus from the dead, and a lot of people, especially the government, was looking to find a way to arrest Jesus and eventually have him killed, and yet Jesus goes into the context. He goes to Simon the leper's house near Jerusalem where there's a party being thrown for him, and yet it didn't mess with him that he knew that he was going to be sentenced to death even though he did nothing wrong. John Calvin, uh, a theologian, writes about this this way. He says, we ought to remember Christ's design, which was that he came to Jerusalem on his own accord to offer himself to die. For it was necessary that his death should be voluntary because the wrath of God could be appeased only by a sacrifice of obedience. They, they went. They is this great crowd from verse 12 that had come for the festival of the Passover to remember the grace of God that was extended to their ancestors by passing over each of the homes of the families who sacrificed a lamb, took the blood of that lamb, put it on their doorpost so that their firstborn sons would not be sacrificed, that they would not be killed as the angel of the Lord would pass over each of their homes. This festival was one that many pilgrims, many tourists from all over the area, including Galilee, would be coming to, and most of them, if not all of them, had probably heard about the resurrection of Lazarus that this carpenter named Jesus, this makeshift rabbi, had done. They, they were looking for a Messiah that would come and overthrow the government and the regime that was taking over the Jewish nation. That's important. And here's why that's important, because even though they're going to see Jesus fulfill a prophecy, something that was said about what the Messiah would do beforehand, they, probably a lot like us, will misinterpret the Scriptures and start to paint a picture of a Messiah that would fulfill our desires rather than the one of the Word. Because it's much easier, honestly, to imagine a king who would come by force rather than to come and sacrifice himself for the people that he came for. But that's what Jesus came to do. And the world has never been the same because of what he's about to do. Verse 13, They, the crowd, took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. They took palm branches. Commentators, often when you're studying a passage, there are certain things that commentators will disagree on, and uh, here's one of the things they disagree on. A lot of commentators want to say that this crowd that is shouting Hosanna on Sunday by Friday is saying, crucify him. And then other people will say, no, it's not the same crowd. But here's the thing. The Scripture in all four Gospels, they're kind of quiet on this, so I don't really want to take a liberty. But here's what I do see. They laid down palm branches. Palm branches were a nationalistic symbol. They were this thing that they were laying down to say, hey, we want a liberator to come, and we want a liberator to come and lead us, the nation of Israel, towards freedom from this empire that had been oppressing us, which was the Roman Empire. So they may have seen him as a Messiah, but they probably saw him more as a political Messiah than a spiritual Messiah. So they shout, Hosanna, which means save now. And this is what it means. It's a Jewish word that means deliverance. The one who saves gives salvation now. Here are different definitions for it. As they say this, they're praising him for what they expect that he represents, which is deliverance. Hosanna, they shout, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're quoting the Old Testament. They're quoting Psalm 118, where it says this in verse 25, Lord, save us, Hosanna. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this sounds really good, but there is also the fact that what looks like worship for this God-man really could be more about Jesus and what he could do rather than who he is. There was a song we sang last week. It was called Nothing Else. And in that song, there was this lyric that said, oh, I'm here. I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. It's him that we ought to want. 
It's Jesus Christ and a relationship with him that we ought to want, not just because of what he can do for us. And this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what being a Christian is all about. See, the world is very punitive. I don't know if you're familiar with that word, but it kind of means an eye for an eye. If you scratch my back, then I'll scratch yours. To quote an old Janet Jackson song, but what have you done for me lately is kind of the perspective that a lot of us have. So our praise and our devotion, not just towards God, but really celebrities and people that we like, really tends to be based on some type of transaction. How do they make us feel and things like that. And even though God did for you and I what we could not do for ourselves and offered us more grace and mercy than we could ever comprehend or grasp, loving God for who he is rather than what he has done for you or even done for you lately is something that maybe we just can't understand. But as we mature, as we grow, as we trust and follow him, hopefully we see that all he has done is because it's who he is. It's part of his character. He gives you mercy because he's merciful. He gives you grace because he's gracious. He loves you because God is love. He sacrificed for you because our God is sacrificial. And when we don't feel him or we forget all that he has done and is doing, it's not because he's changed, but because, and the Bible is very clear and talks about this a lot, I'm a sheep. I'm a, nope, it's I'm a sheep to back. Okay, we've forgotten all of John earlier on. That's fine. That was so many chapters ago. Listen, we're a forgetful people, obviously. And we often focus more on what is done for us in the moment than who God is. So here's a question I want you to wrestle with. If you're in a community group, you're leading a community group, write this question down. This is a good question to wrestle with. Do you want Jesus because of what he can do for you or because of who he is? Do you want Jesus because of what he can do for you or who he is? At the end of the Bible, at the, uh, the last book of the Bible known as Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, Jesus is speaking. He speaks to a bunch of different churches, and he talks about how a lot of these churches started off good. And he's talking about the church in Ephesus, which we know is the book of Ephesians. And he's speaking to the church of Ephesus, and here's what Jesus says to the church. He says in Revelation 2, chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, I know your deeds. I know your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured harsh hardships for my name and have not grown weary, yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. There is this thing that happens when we first come to Christ. It's almost like a honeymoon phase, if you will, if you're familiar with that term. When we first come to Christ, we're so excited, not because we know the long list of things that he's done for us, even though the reason that we exist is because of him, the reason we have breath in our lungs is because of him, the fact that he marked out all the days of our lives because he can do that. In fact, he gave us the families that we entered into this world through. But when we first come to Christ... It's because God in all of his grace and all of his mercy has decided to draw you to himself and you for the first time see Jesus for who he is. That's what so many of us get away from, if we're honest. I bet you if I asked for a show of hands, I'm not going to do it, but if I asked you if you felt kind of distant from the Lord, many of you would probably say yes. And you know what's interesting about that? He didn't go anywhere. And we're forgetful. Often we focus more on circumstances than we focus on a crowned king who is unchanging. In fact, the Bible says he's unchanging. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and, to, yesterday and today and forever. Amen. So in verse 13, at the end of what the, what the crowd is screaming, it says, Blessed is the king of Israel, and oh, is Jesus the king of Israel. That is for sure. But he's so much more. See, Jesus is the king of his people. Jesus is the king of the kingdom of God. But what they said at the end, that wasn't a direct quote from Psalm 118. As this may have been added because the crowd was more focused on themselves than they were focused on the king of the kingdom. So let me step on some toes right now. You guys ready? All right. Anyone? Anyone ready? Okay. It's, it, don't say as. It's about you. Here's the thing. I love our country. 
I love our country. I love the United States of America. I don't love everything that's done here. Most of it, if not all of the politics, seem to be ridiculous and seem to be messed up and depraved. But I am still very grateful for the country that God has allowed me to be a part of my entire life. But my love for this country should always pale in comparison to my love for the king of the kingdom of God. Amen. We assume a lot of things about people depending on their nationality. You guys know that? (laughs) You laugh because you're like, yeah, on the way here. (laughs) We assume a lot of things about uh, uh, people's nationality or where they're from. In fact, this is said about Jesus earlier on in John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, verses 45 and 46, Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, Jesus in the Old Testament, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Listen to Nathanael's response. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Hayward? Could anything good come from there? (laughs) And when we assume or judge or expect something from someone because of their origin, we're stripping them of the opportunity to be the result of something more than just their hometown. Did you guys know we do this? Watch, I'm going to try it. We do this all the time. We assume this. All right. Let me tell you, let's just imagine that you ran into someone and they told you they were from Utah. What's the first thing you think of? Mormon. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Thanks, Kevin. He was just in Colorado. <laughs> you think Mormons, you don't go, hey, have you been to Cracker Barrel? You think Mormons. That's the first thing you think. Did you guys know that if you're from California and you tell someone from out of the state that you're from California, that they prejudge you? Did you know that? Just leave the state and go tell someone you're from California. It's amazing. My wife and I were on a cruise. We'd like to go on cruises. This was like a decade ago. We're on a cruise. We met this great couple from England, and they talked so cute. And we had this conversation, and we were talking, and then they asked where we're from, and we said California. And they said, oh, do you know my cousin? (laughs) No. (laughs) No, no, I don't. Oh, do you know Tom Cruise? (laughs) No, no, I don't. But hear me. There's a lot of assumptions that are made about you because of where you're from. But your origin isn't your destination. Your origin is not your destination. It's part of the story that God is and will write as he draws people to himself for the glory of his name. So please, okay, look at me, look at me. Please don't put your hope in the city. Please don't put your hope in your state. Please don't put your hope in your country or some earthly leader. And please don't think that Jesus is the, G- the God of America or of some political party. Jesus is the king, and every knee shall bow. In fact, a preacher in Texas says it this way, you'll either bow or you'll bow because we have a God who is worthy of our respect when I have breathed my last breath and I stand before my God, I believe I'm going to bow because I love him, because I know him, because I've had a relationship with him and he is holy and I stand before him and I bow not because I'm condemned, but because Jesus has already taken the wrath that I deserved upon himself. Verse 14, first part of it. Jesus found a young donkey, I like this in King James by the way, and sat on it John barely describes at all what happened here regarding the donkey. I'll only say it once, sorry. But all of the other Gospels take a lot more than just half a verse to explain what's happened here. In fact, Matthew writes it this way. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Matthew, the gospel, according to Matthew, gives us a little more, and he tells us what Jesus says to his two disciples as they are ambassadors for the Lord to go into town and find a donkey and a colt. Jesus is essentially saying this, hey, go into town and take them, and if anyone gives you any trouble, just tell them you're with me. I used to always think that this whole scenario was a Jedi mind trick, right? 
Like, Jesus said to them, hey, go, in, go into the town and say these droids are not the ones you're looking for, right? Like, that's what it feels like, and yet that's not at all what happened. Probably what happened was the guy who owned these were, were believers in Jesus. They were following the Lord, and he wanted to do whatever he could to, to serve the Lord, and so giving these to his ambassadors, ah, makes sense. But then it goes on, verse 14, John writes and points out something. He says, as it is written, pointing back to the Old Testament, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. John is pointing out why Jesus did this, and it was to show, but it was more importantly, to fulfill a messianic prophecy found in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, where it says, rejoice, Greatly, daughter Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king coming to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. See, prophecy is fulfilled here. This isn't because Jesus did this so he could make it seem like he was the Messiah. This was foreseen by the prophets that they would see that Jesus was going to be the fulfillment of this written in the Old Testament. Jesus is in and through the Old Testament. Prophecies were not things that were said that Jesus would then attempt to do, but they were seen beforehand by prophets that the Messiah would be recognized by this. Prophets in the Old Testament spoke this way, thus saith the Lord. That's how they spoke, as they were influenced by the Holy Spirit. And in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, Peter speaks about this. He says, for prophecy had never it had never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Prophets were led by the Holy Spirit. They spoke for God, but check it, not everything a prophet said was scripture. Not everything a prophet said was prophecy, but when they were led by the Holy Spirit, their words were documented and became part of the Old Testament, which helps us know God and who He is and the history of God and His people. Paul writes about this understanding of how important the prophets were in the Old Testament. He says it this way in Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 20. Consequently, speaking to the church, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. The prophets, prophets often spoken about in the, in the New Testament represent the Old Testament. When they talked about the prophets, it was to point out what the Old Testament was, the Hebrew scriptures where God revealed himself through his holiness and the law that was given so that we could know how to love God. Not that we could keep the law, in fact, none of us can, but that he would send the one who could keep the law in our place, and be the perfect sacrifice for his people. So why don't we have prophets anymore that we write down what they say? Hear me, because Scripture is complete. We don't need any more revelation. It's in the Word of God. We don't need any more revelation that becomes truth. Instead, we dive deeper into God's truth because the will of God is revealed through the complete Word of God written by the Spirit of God. So now, as the prophets have been used to complete the Old Testament and the apostles, the sent ones, the people who had seen Jesus alive after he resurrected, have completed the New Testament, prophecy, while still existing to today, okay, prophecy still exists, I believe, it exists in a different mode. It's a different emphasis. See, now when we prophesy, it's sharing, it's sharing what the Spirit has revealed through his word that's already complete. Many within the congregation, this congregation, if you know it or not, are prophetic. Many of you speak things, and I don't think you know that what you're saying is actually from the Lord, but you say something, and it's like, what? How'd you, what? And sometimes you know, and sometimes you don't, and generally, I won't tell you because I don't think you're mature enough to hear it. Because sometimes we, oh, I'm prophetic. Well, I'm a prophet. I should have a better parking spot. No! <laughs> But even when you're prophetic, because it's God speaking through you, you ought not take credit for it. As often as what we share is something we don't know God is actually using, neither are we the point, but the one who gave the message and who the message points to is the point. 
Verse 14 and 15, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Not only is this Jesus riding on this little pony, a uh, fulfillment of a prophecy, but it is a great symbol of our king who doesn't come the way that the world would expect. He doesn't come in representation of power as he rides into Jerusalem. He doesn't come in a tank. He doesn't come in a Bentley. What's he do? He comes on my little pony. One that, according to the other gospel writers, had never been written, written before, and one that was not impressive, it was not gaudy, it was not blinged out, but it was unassuming and it was new. Jesus comes not in the way the crowd would expect. I would say almost surprisingly underwhelming. I wonder if there were people in the crowd that are like, that's the Messiah? Oh, he's from Nazareth. Why isn't he on a thoroughbred? Where's his massive entourage? Why does he have fishermen with him? I wonder if that's what they were thinking. But verse 16, at first his disciples did not understand all this. They didn't even understand why they were giving him the pony. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that, things, that these things had been done to him. At first, the disciples did not understand all this, it says. They did not understand necessarily who Jesus really is. They may have had better understanding of who Jesus is than, let's say, the crowds who pictured him as a political figure, but just having good theology is not what God expects from us. You hear me? But to know him, the real him, revealed in his word, confirmed and decoded, if you will, by the Holy Spirit is something that without the eyes to see or the ears to hear, you cannot really grasp. Because when God draws you, he gifts you the eyes to see and the heart to want him. This isn't something that you just try harder to do, but your affections are changed by the Lord and what you do, your actions become more and more apparent that you love God as you love other people because that's what God does in his people. Understanding, or let's say it this way, the lack of understanding seems to be a theme in the book of John, especially when we began the book years ago. We studied where people over and over again heard what Jesus said, and they heard him literally. They heard him physically, and they totally missed the spiritual reality of what he was saying. See, he didn't speak this way to confuse people as much as he spoke this way to show where people's perspective was at. See, if learning is the point, the Pharisees should have picked up on all of this, but they didn't. They missed it because they didn't have the eyes to see and their hearts were hardened to the truth because they didn't obey it for the right reasons. Hmm. But when you see Jesus for who he is, it's not because you worked really hard or because you were more religious than someone else, or you got to church on time. But because when you're redeemed by God, he gives us the gift of the perspective to see him for who he really is. You've seen behind the curtain. You've seen the spoiler to the story. Have you ever known the end of the movie before you saw it? For some of us, like, that's frustrating because, like, there are three things I, I don't want people spoiling. Marvel movies, uh, Star Wars movies, and the Niners game if I'm going to go watch it on TiVo with Kyle, okay? Like, those are the three things I don't want to have spoiled. But here's the thing. Sometimes when we know the end, it helps us appreciate the journey even more. Listen, if you're with Jesus, spoiler alert, you win. Not because of anything you've done, not because you're good enough or kind enough or cute enough or whatever. It's because God, you are with him. You win. Not because you did anything, but because he did something so that you could be made right. You have a life to live for the glory of God. And because you know how it all ends, because you know how it all works out in the end, you don't have to live as if you need to earn anything. Or do anything to be saved. Why? Because salvation has come to you in the person, in the work, in the death, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when we understand that, we get to have an eternal perspective. Verse 16, only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and the, that these things had been done to him. Only after Jesus was glorified, only after the death and resurrection of Jesus did they understand. Only then did God reveal 
what all of the scriptures meant. Only then did their perspective change, one that could see Jesus for who he is, that he is exalted, that he is resurrected, that he is sacrificial, that he is Alpha and Omega, that he is the King of Kings, that he is the great Hosanna, that he is the great I Am. He was always these things, but it was only by God's gift that they could see it, that they could see him, that they could see God. It's a monumental moment in every believer's life when they come to Christ and have their minds open to the fact that the Bible is all about Jesus. That's obvious in the New Testament, right? Like they, from the first words and, you know, throughout every book, it's talking about Jesus. But what if I told you that the Old Testament is all about Jesus? Every book of the Bible, every chapter, every passage, every verse is so that you can see Christ and you can know him. That is the greatest spoiler that any one person can hear. The entire word is about him. So when my perspective was changed, I realized that it wasn't Old and New Testaments, but it was foreshadowing and fulfillment. It wasn't old and new. It was foreshadowing and fulfillment. In fact, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5 as he's preaching the most well-known sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I wonder what preachers who want to only preach the New Testament do with this verse or don't want to have to deal with the imagery and the history of the Old Testament. I wonder what they do with verses like this, because the great news of the gospel did not begin when Jesus was born to Mary. It began before the foundation of the world was created. And Jesus has always been the point, he will always be the point, and Jesus even pointed this out himself. Guess where I get all of this? You ready? The Bible. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. This is after Jesus has lived, he's died on a cross, this is a week ahead, died on the cross, resurrected from the dead, and he starts to show himself to people. And Luke writes it this way, now the same day, two of them, his disciples, Jesus's, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. This is crazy. Like, walks up, hey, what's up? Hey, guy, right? Like, they don't know who he is. And Jesus asked them, verse 17, what are you discussing together as you walk along? (laughs) Jesus knows. They stood still, their faces downcast. And then verse 18, one of them named Cleopas asked him, "Are, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? This is all, if I'm Jesus, I'm like, gotcha, you know, like, I, he kept them from knowing who he is. And then verse 19, what things, he asked. He's totally playing possum here. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. You mean me? He didn't say that. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him, but he had hoped But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb earlier this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And then Jesus responds, Verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Old Testament. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. It's all about him. It all points to him. See, the scriptures don't just point to Jesus in rare passages. But Jesus is the filter. He is the Easter egg. He is the perspective that makes all of the scriptures not only make sense, but connect with one another. Jesus is patterned, promised, or present on every page of the Old Testament. And if you can't find Jesus as you read the Old Testament, I'd contend you're reading it wrong. And pray, I encourage you to pray that God would change your perspective.
See, the word became flesh, and he dwelled among us, and the word knows you, but church, do you know him? I'm not saying do you know a lot about him. I'm not saying you can quote verses back at him like Satan. I'm saying do you know him? Do you have a relationship with him? Because Jesus He's before all things. He has always been. His life did not start when he was born to Mary. He has always been. When the foundation of the earth was created, he was there. When man was created in God's image, Jesus was there. When Jacob wrestled with God, Jesus was there. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar, I believe Jesus was there. When Daniel was in the lion's den, Jesus was there. When you're going through a storm, church, Jesus is there. When you stop breathing through your lungs, Jesus is there. There is nothing in or outside of this world that is outside of Jesus' control or sight. Without Jesus, this world would not spin. It is he who keeps the world spinning the way that it does a little slower, and we'd all freeze to death a little faster, and we'd all burn up. It is Jesus who holds all things together for the glory of his name. When you read from Genesis to Revelation, you read the word of God because the God of the word revealed himself in the scriptures and Jesus is there. Jesus is here. Jesus is alive in his people. Verse 17. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. When they heard about Lazarus, this message continued to be spread. And the news of this miracle continued to spread more and more to people who had heard about the event and they had heard about Jesus' reputation, especially as he came into Jerusalem and it was becoming more and more well-known. Jesus, who was born to Mary, who was born to Joseph, they had heard about this guy, but now these stories were of incredible power that had been started to give clues that maybe Jesus was the Messiah that the Old Testament spoke about. Verse 18, many people, because they had heard they did perform this sign, went out to meet him. They wanted to get a peek at this possible deliverer for Israel that had performed a miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. Verse 19, so the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Oh, silly Pharisees, exaggerating again saying that the whole world is going after him. That's not true. As many upon many in this context and in our context today do not believe that Jesus is who he said he was or who he says that he is, and many did not want to believe in God's plan, which was to justify through a perfect sacrifice rather than people just trying harder. Um, Church of the Valley, I am so happy about what God is doing in this place. I am so happy what he's done over the past few years at Church of the Valley. I don't know what I expected the results to be, but what they are now just blows my mind. When I originally took on this this responsibility of being the pastor at COV, I think I really wanted to really just do this discipleship experiment. I wanted to see if discipleship could happen in the church. And I don't know what to compare it to, but I'll compare it to nothing. It's happening, but it's not happening enough. Because we all ought to be giving away what we're learning. We all ought to be learning from people that are better than us and are farther ahead than we are. But I wanted to see what would happen if we just focused on discipleship. And I think the thing that God has done in spite of me, what I thought was the main reason of coming to COV, which was to try discipleship, really was to be a community of people that emphasize Jesus Christ. It was to be a group of people that go, you know what, the gospel's the point. I'm going to live my life with the gospel being the point. And here's why I say that, because I don't ever want any of us to stop pursuing Christ's likeness. We believe that we grow into the likeness of Christ as we are doers of the word for the right reasons. Like, that is something we're going to constantly say. But that's not the point. The point, as much as we want it to be uh, one of our own preferences, here's the point, that no matter What Sunday you come and worship here with us, no matter who's preaching, no matter if you're in a community group or in a one-on-one discipleship relationship with somebody, if you're serving in some ministry, we want the good news of the gospel of grace in the person and work of Jesus Christ to be what unifies us, what purifies us, and we want the gospel to be the emphasis because it's all about him. 
It's all about him. The gospel is our emphasis. It is what unifies us, and it is what purifies us. Now, as I started, I know that when we hear something over and over, there's a really good possibility that's going to harden our heart. And yet, Scripture also says that we're a forgetful people. I'm a sheep. Okay, a little better memory. We are sheep, and we're a forgetful people, and we forget. And so, I share the gospel with you, knowing it might harden your heart. I share it with you, knowing it might just make you go, oh gosh, he's talking about the gospel again. And I'm not going to apologize for that ever. But hear me, it's when you grasp the gospel, when you grasp the good news, when you realize that he did do for you what you could not do for yourselves, that he did live the life that you couldn't live, he died the death you should have died, he physically rose from the dead, verifying that he is who he says that he is. We say this a lot, and we say it a lot because we want you to understand that we're forgetful, and we don't ever want you leaving this place thinking that our emphasis is anything but Christ crucified, resurrected, and reigning. It's all about him. And we want you to know you can be in right relationship with God because God has given you a perspective to see him for who he is. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And yet God, in his grace, has offered you the gift of his son. Not because you deserve him. In fact, none of us do. But when God opens our eyes to how beautiful his gift is, we can't refuse him. Because we can finally, with a spiritual perspective, see how destitute, how bankrupt we are without him, and how in need we are of immeasurable grace. And not because we earned it or did anything to make us worthy, but God and his generosity gives us what we don't deserve in salvation that belongs to him, gifted to us wholly and solely in Jesus Christ. Worship team, would you come on up?